Hi, this is Chris Monk at Highline Guitars, and you're watching episode 47 of From the Luthier's Workbench. In the last episode, uh, which was episode 46, I started what I think is going to be a four-part series on how I design my electric guitars. And in that episode, I talked a little bit about uh, what inspires me as far as the design of the guitars, where I get my ideas. Then I showed you a full-size, full-scale drawing that I did on my computer in Adobe Illustrator um, of one of the guitars. And I explained that the reason why I do these full-size, full-scale drawings is so that I can, uh, I can see the design on paper and then I can uh, see how the relationship is between all the different components and the design to make sure that the guitar is going to work properly. Uh, in the end, I want a guitar that has maximum adjustability so that anybody can play it. Uh, but I, I like to see this beforehand because I don't like to get halfway through a build only to discover that the bridge that I chose isn't going to work with the neck that I made. So I like to iron out all those details first. Well, in this episode, I'm going to take it a little bit further and I'm going to show you the files that I create. Uh, prior to building the guitar. Now you're probably thinking, well, since I have a full-size, full-scale drawing, why don't I just use that and head out to the shop and start building the guitar? Well, the reason is, is because I use uh, CNC technology these days. And to do uh, the work with the CNC machine, I have to prepare specific files. And that's what I'm going to talk about in this episode and the next couple of episodes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fire up the programs uh, on my computer and why don't you come in a little closer and I'll show you kind of walk you through the process that I go through to prepare these files for CNC. The process that I use to set up my CNC files follows the same order of steps that I'm going to follow when I actually build the guitar and the reason I do that is because there's so many steps involved there's a chance that one of them could be overlooked or forgotten. So I find it's best to follow the same order every time. And this is an order that I've established through experience. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by making the fretboard and then I'll make the neck. And then after I finish the neck, I'll make the body. And the reason I follow that order is because I like to have a finished neck in my hand before I start making the body. And the reason for that is, even though I'm using CNC technology to make the neck, there's always the possibility during the final sanding phase that the dimension will change ever so slightly. And even though it's not a lot, it may only be like a thousandth of an inch or you know, two thousandths of an inch, that small uh, change in dimension will affect the shape of the pocket on my guitar and possibly the position of the bridge. So I like to have that finished neck so I can measure it to make sure that um, if I need to make any adjustments to the body file, I can do that before I start to make the body. Now once I have the, uh, this part of the drawing, this top view and, and side view down, I'm ready to go ahead and start preparing the files for the fretboard. And as I mentioned in the uh, last episode, um, I use FretDefine 2D to design my fretboard. And I'm not going to get into the details about how this program works. This is an online program. If you Google FretDefine 2D, uh, you should come across it. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to find. But um, it allows you to change all these different parameters and therefore design a fretboard to your specifications. And then once you have that design, you can save it out in a multitude of different formats. I like to use PDF single page because I can open that up in uh, Adobe Illustrator and work on that file. So once I've created this and saved it out as a PDF file, I'll go back into Adobe Illustrator and this is what that file looks like when I open it up. It's basically the same as what you saw on the website. But what I need, can do now is I can use this file as a template to prepare the files for CNC. So what I have to do is I have to redraw it uh, into a, a file that is going to work best for my CNC workflow. And this is what that file looks like. What it includes is the outer shape, all the fret slots, and then these little uh, uh, hash marks on the side here are, or tick marks, are um, the fret 
marker positions. And this is just my own design that I came up with. Uh, the document size will match the uh, blank that I'm going to be carving this fretboard out of. And in this case, it's 3.5 inches wide, 24 inches tall. Uh, later on, I'll establish the thickness, which is 3 16ths of an inch, or 0.1875 inches. So once I have this file, I'll save it as a native Adobe Illustrator file, but then I'll also save a copy as a .svg file. And .svg stands for Scalable Vector Graphic. And the reason I do that is because that's the format that my uh, CNC software recognizes. And I actually have to create a second file in, in Adobe Illustrator. And the second file is going to be for the radius. And that file looks like this. And it includes that same outer perimeter shape. But then down here at the bottom, you'll see it includes this kind of a funky shape down here, this rectangle. And if you look closely, you'll notice the top of it is curved. That uh, represents the radius. This is actually a profile shape, um, which I've drawn at the widest part of the fretboard. And that radius, in this case, is 16 inches. So I'll use this file for generating uh, the radius, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. So once I have my scalable vector graphic saved out, I can then jump into the program that I use um, on my computer to uh, send the file to the CNC machine. And the program that I'm going to use in this case, there's going to be a couple of them, but um, for most of the two-dimensional cutting that I do, I'll be using Easel, which is the software program developed by Inventables, and um, it's designed specifically to work with the XCarve, which is the CNC machine that I use. And I'll bring the file into um, Easel, and this is what Easel looks like. Uh, on the left side, you've got your workspace where you lay out your design. On the right side is a three-dimensional representation of what that file is going to look like. Now, I'll bring in that file, and it actually will look something like this when I bring it in. Um, it has all the different components. But what I need to do is I need to set up separate files for each cutting operation. So I'll do this file, which is, um, it, you'll notice I've, I've numbered it. It's uh, 1.0 Osiris 7 MS for multi-scale uh, fretboard slots. And this one is going to be set up just to cut the slots for the fretboard. And um, I'm not going to get into details about all the different settings that I have to follow, but I have to pick a bit size. I have to set um, the uh, feed and speed rates. And then, um, the, of course, I have to set the, the stock dimensions and all that. So, um, but I'll start by doing the fret slots. Then the second file is uh, going to be for my fret marker designs that I created. And that requires that I have to change the bit, uh, change the feed and speeds. And that's why I have to do a separate file. Then the third file is actually going to be done using a different a whole different workflow. Those first two files that I set up in Easel, uh, the one for the slots and then the other for the marker dots, are two-dimensional cuts and Easel is really designed to handle those type of cuts very well. However, for a more complex shape, a three-dimensional shape like a radius uh, fretboard or the contour of a guitar neck, requires a completely different workflow. And what I have to do is I have to create a three-dimensional model, and I'll use that three-dimensional model to create the G-code necessary to run the CNC machine. So what I'm going to do is I jump back into Illustrator here, and this is that uh, file I showed you earlier for the uh, fretboard radius. What I'm going to do now is I need to import that into my 3D program. And the 3D program I use is Rhinoceros 3D. Now I should have mentioned um, this is all being done on a Macintosh. I use an iMac, so all the software I'm using is iMac uh, software. However, all these programs are available for uh, Windows as well, and they work pretty much the same. But this is what that file looks like when I bring it into the 3D workspace in Rhinoceros. 
uh, it's still flat and two-dimensional. So what I have to do is I have to use these elements to create the uh, radius 3D shape of the fretboard. And I'm not going to go into detail about how I do that because it would take too long to explain it. But uh, once I've uh, created that 3D shape, this is what it's going to look like. And as you can see, I have just the shape of my seven string multi-scale fretboard. And if you look closely, you can see how that top surface is radius. So now what I can do is use this model to establish the tool paths that uh, the CNC machine requires. And to do that, what I have to do is export a version of this file as a stereolithography file, or S .stl. And the reason I do that is because the program that I use to set up my tool paths uh, is called MeshCam. And MeshCam requires the .stl format. So what I do is I open that .stl into MeshCam, and this is what it looks like. Uh, the white line you see going around is the, uh, the perimeter shape of the stock that I'm going to use. And if you remember, when I set this up in Illustrator, it was 3.5 inches wide, 24 inches long. And once I get in MeshCam, I can set it to um, my 3 16 inch thickness, which is uh, 0.1875 inches. When I got the uh, file opened, what I'll do is I'll establish my program zero. And this is where the router, the CNC router, starts from. And you have to set that so that the router knows where it's going to be moving to carve. And I always set that up for the lower left corner of my stock. And then I can set my tool paths. And to do that, this is um, the parameters that I have to set up. And I'm not going to go into detail again. Um, my goal really here isn't to ex uh, explain in detail the entire workflow uh, so that you can replicate it. Uh, that would just simply take too long. It would take hours and hours and hours of work. Uh, what my goal is is to try to give people an understanding of what goes on behind the scenes. Because I think too many people assume that when you're going to CNC a guitar, all you have to do is uh, throw your blank on the wasteboard and then uh, press the carve button and watch it make a guitar for you. And that's just not the case. There's a huge amount of work that goes on in the background. So uh, back to this, what I do is I'm going to set up two carving passes with my tool and I can select the size of the bit that I'm going to use. In this case, it's an eighth inch diameter bit, but I'll do a roughing pass and then I'll do a finishing pass. And the roughing pass obviously just cuts a, it does the radius very rough, very coarse. And then the finishing pass comes back and cleans it up and makes it very smooth. Once I've reached that point, um, I, all that's necessary to, to finish that fretboard is just a light sanding to take out some of the barely noticeable tool marks that are left over. Um, but I'll uh, create this tool path and it's going to look something like this. All the, uh, the, this green, if you zoom way in on it, you can see it's just lines. And that's the movement of the router. And um, I can see how long it's going to take. In this case, it's going to take about 31 minutes to cut that radius, which is pretty good when you consider how long it takes to do it by hand. So what I'll do at this point is I'll save that toolpath, and I'll just save it as a G-code file, which I've already done, so I'm not going to do it again. Um, but once I have that G-code file, I can then send that G-code to the CNC machine. And the way I do that is I use a program called Universal G-Code Sender. And this is a free program that you can download from the Internet. It's available for Mac and Windows and all that. But what I do is I... I'll link it up to my machine and then I will browse for that G code file, which in this case is Osiris 7 MS for Multiscale Fretboard Radius NC. NC is the G code file extension. So I'll open that up and I'll send it to the CNC machine. I don't have this computer linked up to my uh, CNC machine, so I can't open a connection to it. But if I did have it connected, once I have that file opened up into Universal G-Code Center, all I'd have to do is click the Send button, 
and that G code would be sent to the CNC machine and it would begin carving that radius into the fretboard. And that would be the third file. So once that uh, file, that radius has been cut, which uh, as we saw before, it would take about 31 minutes to cut it, then I can go back to easel again and then load the fourth program, the fourth file, which is the outer perimeter shape of the, of the fretboard. And again, I prefer to do this in easel because it's a two-dimensional cut. Um, and you'll notice there are these little yellow tick marks, and those are tabs. And tabs are used whenever you're cutting all the way through a piece of wood because if you don't, that inside piece, the fretboard itself, once you cut through, that piece will be free to move. And when you've got a router spinning at 20,000 RPM with a sharp bit on it, that piece could fly all over your workspace and get damaged. So those tabs remain. And then once that uh, file has been run and we've cut out the outer perimeter shape, the fretboard is essentially complete. And all I have to do is remove the uh, stock from the wasteboard and then clip those tabs to free the fretboard from the, the stock. And at this stage, uh, all I need to do um, is do a light sanding uh, to remove any remaining tool marks that might be present. There's sometimes a few very light ones. So I can sand it with like some 220 to 400 grit. Then I can install my frets. Then I can take that fretboard and glue it down to the neck. However, before I can glue it to the neck, I need to make the neck. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next episode of From the Luthiers Workbench. So stay tuned.